Okay, good morning again, and welcome to the International Peace Institute. I'm Andrea O'Sullivan. I'm a policy analyst here at IPI, and I'm very pleased to welcome you today, together with our partners for this project on cities under stress, building urban resilience, the Institute of South Asian Studies of the National University of Singapore. A special welcome also to our case study authors, many of whom have traveled great lengths to be here and present their work today. You have the agenda and participants list in front of you, and that has a biography of every speaker. They'll be introduced throughout each session, at the start of each session, throughout the day, so I won't take time to do that now. The issue that brings us together today, cities under stress or urban fragility, really raises the links between violence, development, and governance. And we've organized today's seminar, and in fact, the case study presentations around these three lenses. I want to emphasize that we recognize that there's a great deal of overlap and interaction between these areas, but that in fact, it is that kind of nexus that's at the heart of urban fragility and efforts to build resilience in cities. This has been emphasized in some recent research, this link between violence, governance, and development. Um, I think this is a reflection of the changing nature of violence, moving from civil war and conflict towards greater criminal violence and civil unrest. Indeed, just last year, the number of violent deaths in cities exceeded the number of violent deaths in conflict zones. And as we've quoted on our agenda, according to the report of the UN High-Level Panel on Post-2015 Development, cities are where the battle for sustainable development will be won or lost. So we come together today to explore these issues, and to do that, IPI and ISAS have commissioned six case studies on urban fragility and toward some qualitative recommendations to foster resilience. The selected cities are diverse across regional characteristics, population size, growth rate and density, economic development and income inequality, and many of these other factors. So we're here to discuss these and look towards resilience, but I think also given our location across the U from the UN and having many participants here from various United Nations offices, we also come together today to ask, what does this rise in violence in cities, the population explosion in cities, and this central question of urban development mean for the UN? From its peacekeeping work to humanitarian activities, and of course, the approach to development. So just as a recap, we convened the first seminar for this project in March in Singapore, with a focus especially on the three case studies of Asian cities. And after today's conversation, our six authors will go back and incorporate key insights from the discussion into their case studies, which we will then compile and we should release this autumn. So today, we just want to emphasize that we really ask all of you to share your deep experience in cities across these areas of development, security, governance, and UN engagement. So thank you again very much, and I'll now turn it over to Iftikhar Ahmed Chowdhury, a partner from ISAS, for his welcome remarks. Thank you, Andrea. Could I add my voice to yours uh, in welcoming uh, all of you uh, to this expert seminar? Uh, I do so on behalf of the Singapore-based Institute of South Asian Studies, or ISAS, which, uh, as you have heard, partners this project with, with IPI. Uh, for those of you who may not be aware, ISAS is a think tank dedicated to the study of uh, contemporary South Asian politics and economics based in Singapore. It comprises scholars and policymakers drawn from the countries of the region and also Singapore. I have with me uh, Dr. Amitan Dupalit, uh, sitting across the room, whom I would, uh, should like to introduce to you. Uh, for me personally, it's an enormous delight to come back to this Big Apple, not just because it is the world's greatest city, but the, uh, also that, but because of my personal uh, sentiments combined with a modicum of nostalgia, as I had spent many years here. Uh, uh, over two stints as uh, Bangladesh's ambassador and permanent representative to the United Nations. As you have heard, uh, we uh, covered uh, uh, cities under stress, Bangkok, Dhaka, and Mumbai, the three Asian megacities in our first seminar in Singapore in March. 
uh, on this occasion will take up Lagos, uh, Port-au-Prince, and, um, and Medellin from uh, other uh, corners of the world, globe. Commonalities will be discernible, uh, demonstrating that global trends are often uh, similar. While in terms of solutions, one size may not fit all, individual studies do provide us with uh, toolkits, uh, uh, useful toolkits to be able to uh, 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 contemplate handling issues across the broad spectrum. Uh, now, uh, for instance, we see that urbanization is the most recent global change that has occurred in recent times everywhere. In India, for instance, the urban population would have exceeded half a billion by the year 2020. Throughout South Asia, it's the same story, whether it's crumbling Karachi or a chaotic Calcutta. There are many four causes why this urbanization happens. The lion's share of employment is concentrated in the cities. It includes sectors such as manufacturing, transport, construction, communications, trade, and commerce. And this ren uh, these render the phenomena of rural-urban migration inexorable. It also makes uh, 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 environmental degradation inevitable. Uh, as a Singapore minister recently warned, uh, there is ever-present danger that people could a court stifle themselves under the load of pollution. Slumming is the great uh, urban bane in the developing world. Uh, the slum dog millionaire exists only in fiction and the silver screen. Governance would be a key element in ensuring, uh, ensuring livability. The World Bank has defined it as the manner in which power is exercised in the management of economic and social resources uh, for development. The UNDP uses the term uh, good with governance, introducing the normative element. It is agreed that the criteria desirable in assessing the quality of governance are legitimacy, human rights, accountability, transparency, lack of corruption, efficiency, effectiveness, decentralization, equity, empowerment, and participation. At a recent World Cities Summit held in Singapore earlier this month, participants noted that strong and honest leadership was the only way to ensure that city dwellers would keep their cities clean, green, and peaceful. It is also to be noted that beyond formal governance, there is also a residual informal governance consisting of activities pursued by people themselves either spontaneously or in a sustained manner based on what we know now as social capital. Addressing the problems of the cities under stress would require a coordinated tripartite effort through partnership between the government or civic authority, the civil society, and the private sector. This would involve the following studies and analysis. First, major structural impediments would have to be identified in the composition, function, planning, personnel, man, uh, finance, training, and how these are conducted uh, the, uh, in a, the way they impact on development needs and civic amenities. Second, existing relations and problems of cooperation slash coordination among city slash governments slash central governments and the various service providers and the effects they have on service delivery to the citizens. These would have to be examined. Third, the degree of good governance enumerated earlier would have to be ascertained. And finally, all kinds of governance issues would have to be tackled. As Arnold Toynbee, the historian, had famously surmised, civilizations rise and fall in accordance with the ability to surmount challenges uh, confronting them. So do cities who are, in, who are microcosms of the world. What better example could there be uh, of this than uh, New York itself? It is interesting to observe that, uh, as we do from, uh, from Singapore, located nearby, how uh, uh, how the huge Asian entity China handle, handles the inevitability, inevitability of urbanization. It is now state policy in China to accelerate urbanization despite its manifold challenges. Indeed, by 2020, China's urban population would swell to 1.4 billion, nearly three times the figure noted for India at that time. 
To accommodate this, Chinese leaders have decided to change the growth model so that service and private consumption fueled by the growing number of city dwellers would displace export trade and investments as GDP stimulant. At the recent World C uh, Cities Summit in Singapore that I have referred to earlier, there were also some discussions on the flix flip side experience of some Asian cities. In consonance with Asia's overall rise, uh, in, uh, they are also contemplating on making some of these cities like Singapore itself smarter with advanced technologies. The goal would be to make these urban areas more livable with actually less resources. For instance, in April this year, Singapore Land Authority had the island's entire topography mapped from the air in 3D using lasers and high resolution cameras. These maps would be ready by 2016 and would be used to manage water and flood patterns, among other things. There are two issues, however. One, smart technologies may create unrealistic expectations of governments. And second, the smart city approach must be inclusive, also involving the underprivileged. Nonetheless, much of urban Asia is still woefully stressed as those of other parts of the world. We must identify best practices for sharing and trade common experiences. The impediments are legion. But where there is a will, and indeed there should be no dearth of it, there is a way. This seminar series is a way to raise awareness that delay in addressing these issues would be costly. Yes, we have a hill to climb. And yes, waiting will not make it any smaller. I thank you. Uh, good morning. Um, I, I'm Warren Hogue, IPI Senior Advisor for External Relations. Uh, and I'm here. You will not find me on your program because I'm replacing Robert Mugga, who could not make it at the last moment. Uh, he is the research director of the Igarape Institute in Rio de Janeiro. Uh, I'm delighted to do this um, because of an interest I've had pretty much all my career, most of which was as a journalist, in, in your subject, Cities Under Stress. And I even have familiarity with Rio de Janeiro, the home of the Igarape Institute where I lived and worked for five years as the New York Times correspondent there. That was three decades ago, long before the Institute itself was created. But the condition that led to the Institute's declared pursuit of progressive alternatives for security and development already existed if the attention now paying, being paid to them at events like this uh, did not exist. Over the weekend, I read a fascinating monograph of Roberts, and he will be missed in today's discussion, but the happy side of that development is that we add to the panel IPI's own Andrea O'Sullivan. This first session takes up the fact that alongside the unprecedented urbanization of today, urban fragility has emerged as a central challenge in global development, security, and governance theory and practice. Um, the speakers have promised to speak with economy, giving us time to have a question and answer session afterwards. Uh, you have the full biographies of our panelists in your papers, so I will introduce them just briefly here in the order in which they will speak. Uh, Andrea O'Sullivan is a policy analyst at IPI, where her research focuses on peace building and conflict mediation. She is currently researching the roles of women and civil society in peace processes and the long-term benefits of inclusive mediation. Philippe de Court is the chief technical advisor and the focal point for UN Habitat's crisis-related work in UN Habitat's New York Liaison Office, a post he has held since June of last year. During his career, Philippe has predominantly focused on urban initiatives in conflict and crisis-affected countries, specializing in urban planning, land, and housing issues. Jennifer Salahub is a senior program officer for governance, security, and justice at the International Development Research Center, <clears throat> where she manages the Safe and Inclusive Cities Initiative. 
This global research program documents the links between urban violence, poverty, and inequalities, and supports 15 research teams across 16 countries to find out what works and what doesn't to reduce urban violence in 40 cities. We are webcasting this event today, so when it comes time uh, to, for me to call on you, I'm going to ask you at least the first time to identify yourself for the sake of the webcast audience, and also to speak as I am right now directly into the microphones, because if you turn away like this, you won't be heard. <laughs> uh, so Andrea, will you start us off, please? Thank you, Warren. So very quickly to start, I just want to set the context for this project and seminar and for, I'm sure, a lot of the intense work that you all do in cities. Um, I just want to focus on three elements to start. A few words about the global trend of urbanization, then introducing a concept which, again, we're borrowing from our panelist who was meant to be here today, Robert Mugga, of the urban dilemma, and finally, a brief word about the concept of fragile cities. So first, on urbanization. Urbanization today is truly a global trend. In 1900, only 20% of the world lived in cities. Today, more than half, just over half of the people on the planet live in cities. And by 2050, 80% of the population will live in urban areas. In 1950, only 80 cities in the world had over 1 million people. Today, that number has grown to 480 cities with populations of over 1 million. And births and migrants into cities push that number up by as many as 1 million people every week. Urbanization, of course, brings opportunities, the possibility of jobs, goods, and services for people in developing countries and beyond. And where cities thrive, you have literacy and education, improving and employment opportunities growing. But urbanization also creates new social dynamics. If we look to Cairo, the population there has doubled since 1970. And we can say that the recent Arab Spring is an urban phenomenon facilitated by the networks and the physical proximity that cities offer. On the other hand, growing urban populations create huge demands on housing, transportation, security, and infrastructure, and create vulnerable urban, urban communities. One third, or one of every three people who live in cities, live below the poverty line. And on average, city homicide rates tend to be higher than national rates. So this brings us to this double-edged nature of urbanization today, or the urban dilemma. On the one hand, you have urbanization as a force for progressive development, but on the other, it creates risk of chronic insecurity and underdevelopment among the urban poor. And this urban dilemma, I just want to note again, was the subject of a report actually commissioned by the IDRC, and we have Jennifer here today, so she might speak about it more. Um, but the, the problem, of course, is that the negative effects of urbanization can counter this great potential to stimulate growth, productivity, and economic benefit. So the cities stuck in the urban dilemma could be called fragile cities. And we'll just say a quick word about this, since this is what brings us here today. This is a move in the international literature and the concept of fragile or failed states, states where institutions are so weak that they perhaps don't control the territory within their boundaries, um, there's not adequate service delivery, there's not delivery of what we're again calling the social contract. So fragile cities now are not necessarily in fragile states, but they're urban centers that lack the capacity to deal with all of these risks and challenges that I've just mentioned that come with the rapid pace of urbanization today. In other words, fragile cities lack resilience, the other topic that we we'll, are here to hopefully move toward today. Um, there are at least five drivers of urban fragility that this literature has brought together. Rapid population growth, criminal violence, poverty and inequality, youth bulges and unemployment, and governance failure. So first on population growth, it took New York, where we are now, 150 years to grow a size of 8 million people. 
Karachi moved from 500,000 people to 18 million people in just 60 years. So if you look around the world, you see a much more rapid rate than what we've seen historically. On to criminal violence. The relationship between rates of violence and this rapid urbanization isn't clear cut. In certain countries where the population is mostly rural, you do have violence heavily concentrated in cities. But of course, we have great examples of rapid urbanization in cities like Tokyo, where you maintain low levels of violence. So this is one area where more research is needed to explore these links. Poverty and inequality is a, is a large part of driving urban fragility. And as mentioned before, one third of the world's city dwellers live below the poverty line. Also, inequality is on the rise. So it's not just poverty, but inequality in cities. Globally, between 1988 and 2005, the share of household income for the richest 5% increased by 8%. But for the poorest 25%, this share has decreased by 32%. So many experts are linking this income inequality to ongoing social tensions in countries and especially on this city level. Again, we have high unemployment and underemployment as a driver of fragility. And half of the population in the Arab world, for example, is under 25, with youth employment rates at roughly 50%. The global average of youth unemployment is 13%. So again, you can see the areas where this is emerging in the most stressed way. The final driver shaping urban fragility is the inability of state institutions to regulate and ultimately to manage all the different parts of a city. So we have governance issues coming to the fore of law and order, services, sanitation, and other essential infrastructure that can be missing for many city residents. So just to recap, here are the five drivers that underpin urban fragility. And across our case studies, our authors have highlighted certain ones that are playing out in a stronger way in their particular city. We hope today to be able to dissect some of these risks, to gain insights on our six case studies, but also on the cities that I'm sure many of you have worked in. And I would say another goal is to, in a small way with this project, tip the scales of this double-edged urbanization toward resilience and to begin to discuss how can we make people safer, bring more sustainable development, and reduce violence in cities. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Uh, Philip. Thank you. Um, happy to be here. And I, I just came from across the roads, but this is a big divide for me. So <laughs> I'm uh, exactly, I'm, this is a discourse we've been trying to build up in new habitats over the last uh, years. And recently, we, 20 of us gathered in Brussels, having worked in Afghanistan, Somalia, uh, Haiti, some of the well known long protracted crises. Uh, and we had a hard time exactly kind of translating or normal work on, on acting in cities, trying to improve living conditions with exactly this discussion on fragility uh, and then higher up with peace building and state building. So my discourse might sound a bit fragmented and fragile in itself, but I think for me the interest of being here today is exactly is, is starting to understand better how to cross uh, that divide. Um, Talking about, and I think exactly um, Andrea has, has given you the, the big numbers, and I would say the scary numbers. I'll try to bring it down a bit and give a few concrete examples of uh, what this means in specific, uh, specific countries. Uh, but yes, um, cities uh, under stress has a lot to do, of course, with the numbers. The urban growth in the next decades is almost exclusively going to be in cities. The population dynamics that this goes with exactly, yes, this is not just a, a stable society. This is very much a society in flux with a very often a very strong uh, youth component and an unemployed uh, youth component. Um, as this is the place where economic growth is happening, it's also clear that the conflicts related to that, over resources, is also moving more and more to cities, because that's where the resources are, that's where the economy is, and conflict tends to migrate to cities, not just because that's where the people are, but that's also where uh, the resources are. Uh, if you look at a place like Somalia, for instance, uh, for long, 
the conflict in Somalia was depicted as a conflict over, over, over land, over grazing land, but more and more exactly see that the conflict has shifted to urban areas. It's about, it's about uh, access to the port, access to markets, uh, access to key urban economic uh, functions. And one of the things that goes hand in hand with this rapid urbanization, of course, is the, the conflict over land. Uh, urban, one number you didn't mention exactly, but if in the next decade you have to accommodate 3 billion new urban people, that's doubling the urban space we have today. That land is coming from somewhere. Land is a finite source. Uh, and exactly this in itself is causing a lot of tension. Land very often is exactly owned by, by the traditional families in the, in the area. And the people moving in are exactly are new migrants, not necessarily with access to uh, to land. Um, related to that, of course, is that, and we have a hard time making this argument within the UN and with member states, that urbanization does go hand in hand with a rural transformation. It's not just an urban, rural urban migration. There's a very strong link with urbanization and how countrysides are changing. Uh, and how the economies of countrysides have to change. And again there, this which means a completely different way of producing food because the more people you have in cities, the fewer people have to produce food for that amount of people. So that in itself, I think, is also uh, creating uh, tension. And then the whole supply of food into cities uh, is in itself often problematic. And if you see what's happening in Syria, those supply lines are very often used as a weapon of, of war, uh, intervening exactly in those systems between um, countryside where food comes from and where it is being consumed in uh, cities. We tend to focus a lot also on the impact of urban displacements. Uh, if we talk about exactly acute stress, it often has to do with, with urban displacement. And urban displacement is, is nothing more, if you want to, to put it black and white, than a rapid increase in population in a city without necessarily the city having the capacity to adapt to that new reality. Uh, and it's, it's often seen as a temporary phenomena, but if you look around the world, what happened in, in Sudan, or some of the uh, countries under long-term uh, stress, often this displacement becomes protracted. In the case of the Syria crisis, for instance, we, uh, we did some analysis in, in Jordan, where uh, some of the cities have doubled in size in a very short period in time. If you visit some of those places, you don't necessarily see that doubling in population. But if you start scratching, you get to know that, yes, there was an empty housing stock before. So the first wave was absorbed by empty apartments that were there by Jordanians in the diaspora. Houses seen as an investment, and people renting out the units they already had or they were keeping for their sons and daughters later on. The second wave, people started converting their, uh, their storage space, their garages, maybe quickly adding a, a, a floor to their house. And again, that was being absorbed. The third wave, as this continued, people started subdividing their apartments. And then exactly start talking about densities that go way beyond what was foreseen and planned in those areas. And you get stress on simple things as, as garbage collection, uh, water supply. And that in itself is then the first strain exactly on social cohesion in those neighbors because traditionally there was a link between the people moving in from Syria and the uh, population in place, but that quickly got strained because exactly of uh, the first thing people complained about was cleanness, as simple as that, apart from the bigger issues of jobs. And of course, rents going up, rental prices going up. Now, first reaction of humanitarians was Let's give rental subsidy. And you know, whoever is, is an economist knows what's, what's going to happen. Prices go up again. Uh, and so poor, poor Jordanian families were being pushed out of the, out of the housing market uh, very quickly. So we started talking about the absorption capacity of those cities and how to look at it. Within Syria, we're doing analysis of the major cities, and we're looking at the issue of urban functionality. When do families leave? And it's clear families do not necessarily leave because of, of security, of conflict. Families leave because no longer, no more jobs, no access to markets, no access to services. So understanding the complexity on, on what pushes people out 
and what attracts them to another place, I think is important to uh, to think about a bit more carefully. And I think for us, this is going to, it's, it's a bit of a red line throughout what I want to say is that the complexity of cities and the interconnectedness between different areas of cons and different sectors, if you want, is the main thing we need to get our head around if we want to plan properly and build resilience. And of course, we talked about an equitable access to services. Uh, when we did not work in Somalia, for instance, we looked at access to water. And we often tend to look at a very absolute fact, do people have access to water, yes or no? But we rarely look at affordability. And it was very clear that people that are the poorest were paying the highest price per unit for the water if you compare to people that were better off and had access to water supply uh, systems. Now, the key challenge is exactly, just to, to make a step further for cities under stress uh, and us acting within those uh, contexts. And I have one picture up uh, be behind us. It's a bit unclear because of the light, but on the screens you can see it a bit better. And the main point uh, is that we want to make and where we're trying to work with across the divide with the, exactly the, uh, the people working on governance, uh, people working on security and peacekeeping and peace building, we don't understand cities enough when we act. We don't understand their spatial reality. We don't understand the forces that shape them. And there are political, there are social, there are economical, there are environmental. But in the end, if you bring it down to how do families take decisions? Um, I was in Port-au-Prince after the earthquake and evidently heavily affected people on the, uh, in the slums which are on the heavy slopes at high risk. The easy answer was let's move them out. Let's move them to a safer ground. We advocated for a return to those areas because people had taken the risk before very consciously because that location provided access to services, to jobs, and moving them out was only going to make the situation worse. So it was an issue of managing the technical risk better, mitigate the risk, but making sure that their decision exactly um, was still fully understood and was grounded in reality. The picture behind you is a picture of Bosasso, in northeast, um, northeast Somalia, uh, a city which had 25% had of the population was uh, urban IDPs coming from the south. And because of the clan situation, a lot of tension between the two. Uh, the picture on the right is exactly what the reality of those camps looked like. And on the left, you see the, the kind of, on the outside, it's the same camp. It's on, it's, this is on the outskirts of the city, prime urban land. And still these people were there. And humanitarians were trying to improve the living conditions. And when we did a kind of evaluation and assessments, they had tried to improve the sanitation, major issues with sanitation, no latrines. After 10 years, they have managed to build 140 latrines for 25,000 people. And as a consequence, a lot of violence, a lot of tension with uh, neighboring communities, because of course we're talking about the flying toilet phenomena. If you have no toilet, you put it in a bag and you throw it as far as you can. Now, we started to try to understand what was happening. It was very simple. These landlords were forcing as many IDPs on their land as possible. One, to keep control of the land, kind of a land grab and maintaining their hold on prime urban land. Two, to maximize the rent. And three, they didn't want latrines because they wanted the land to be as ready as possible once the way they wanted to build on it. So we turned this issue into a discussion of a social contract. If you pay a rent, simple economy, what are your basic rights? Right to sanitation. And we made this into a very strong social contract issues involving the whole community on what is the basis. You have access to certain <laughs> fire breaks, certain streets, so you're able to move around and you're able to prevent. And I, I can go on about this example for a long time because there, there are big issues of 25, half of it would burn down every year. Part of it because landlords wanted to move on and, and clear the ground, part of it because of density. Um, but the moment we cracked this issue of, of basic, this was an issue about land and value of land. Uh, the moment we started talking about tenure and making basic agreements, the situation changed completely. And today, um, the, the picture is still, if you look at a satellite image, you will see a completely different uh, situation. Now, moving on is that something again is, is we very often simply say, look, breakdown of cities is never because of sectoral issue, it's systemic. 
uh, if, if a road collapses or a bridge collapses, it's not the physical fact of repairing the, the bridge. It's an issue exactly of access to markets, uh, access to services that completely changes the reality of uh, those neighborhoods and the city around it. So for us, urban resilience is very much about understanding urban systems and how they relate to a wide variety of hazards. And the fragility exactly is not necessarily um, political, social, uh, ec economical. I mean, it can be exactly about a sudden raise in, in uh, prices of goods, basic food. And we had urban crisis in the last uh, decades along those lines. So it's really resilience has to relate to all possible hazards in a city, not just climate change, but we have to take into account all types of hazards. One of the big challenges we have, of course, is that a lot of urban growth is informal, the slums. And traditionally, this is outside the governance system. It's outside the rule of law. And as, as even as local authorities, but also as international actors, we have a hard time dealing with informality. It doesn't fit into our uh, programming. It doesn't fit into kind of mostly top-down way, uh, way of working. Um, Important for us also exactly that we, if you intervene in an urban context, it's an urban dynamics, this has a very long timeline. Cities have a very long timeline. And so it doesn't matter when you intervene, you intervene, you need to be able to place your actions into that longer term time frame. Even if you know that your action is incremental, you can't do everything today, but you're always working exactly more towards more resilient, more inclusive uh, cities. Um, looking at the time, you're the timekeeper? Okay. Um, so I'll, I'll give one example of, of Port-au-Prince that struck me uh, a lot. I mean, we exactly we were advocating for a turn to uh, the neighborhoods, uh, improving slums from the start. There was a push to move some of the IDPs out of town, and uh, the American military was about to leave. So a massive push to do something, but some people were at risk, and thousand families were moved to an area ten kilometers out of town. This area was declared public uh, utility by the government under huge pressure of international community. Today, those 1,000 families are surrounded by 150,000 newcomers. There was a massive land invasion, unplanned, but it's basically now the fourth biggest city in, Port in, uh, uh, in Haiti. And this all came from one simple act to reduce risk. And people moved out 10 kilometers out of town without necessarily the access exactly again to, to jobs. But it happened because people saw an opportunity to access land, again, which is a prime source of stability for families. Uh, and so the move happened at the scale it did. Now, for some people, they said, OK, then, well, the problems of the slums in Haiti, a lot of organized crime, a lot of violence, a lot of gangs, maybe we'll be able to, to manage it now. If you, if you and we started to analyze with the, with the mission, if you were looking into what was happening in terms of how it was organized, from the start, again, this was gang organized. There was a mixture of exactly of local gangs with involvement of, of police and others of the security sectors, but it was an immediately a land market that had developed that was organizing the way uh, that new city was developing, with street names and land being sold on an informal market. But in a way, some of the insecure elements of the slums were being trans. Uh, Trans, um, well, moved exactly to the new location at the same time. And no presence of, of normal government, no presence of, um, of the international community. Now, it brings me to, to another point that, that we tend to stress, and I think Jane will talk about it. Um, we are not very good at, at working multiple levels of governance and very often neglecting the level of government closest to the people, uh, local authorities. Um, we worked in Somalia for uh, myself for five and a half years, and we were trying to really, the first thing we tried to do was give some legitimacy to local authorities that were there. Still not, not necessarily elected, but building, letting, giving them the opportunity to build a social contract with their community and agree on some very quick actions, some quite big, uh, quick peace dividends to make a difference in people's lives, but agreed with the community we were giving out small grants, but it had to be signed off exactly with a broad uh, segment of, uh, of community. And we gave them training. We gave them very basic training to understand their, their leadership role. Because it's not enough to say, look, okay, you're the local government, go for it. 
What does it mean to enable uh, other actors to private sector to, uh, to intervene? What does it mean to communicate uh, with your different parts of society? So this important eff uh, effort also that it is needed to, to rethink roles and responsibilities of different levels of, uh, of government and how exactly they interact with uh, their society, with the rest of their uh, community. We were working in, along those lines in Mogadishu uh, way before any international actor was able to enter. So we were able to work on, on restoring basic market functions, but it was hand in hand with rebuilding a social contract bottom up. And that for me, uh, is my experience, was one of the most important, and without understanding a full relationship with fragility and peace building, but one of the most important things we were doing in, uh, in Somalia. Now to, to come to a close, um, all too often exactly we see this difference between urban and rural where we used to work as just a different setting. For us, I think it's much more. The shift is much bigger than just rethinking, adapting the tools, adapting the methods. I do think it means starting from scratch and really make sure we understand the complexity of cities. As you said, Andrea, for a long time, we were looking at urbanization as a problem. We were focusing on, on mitigating the problems and slum upgrading was a very good example of it. Now in last week, the EcoSec integration segment for the first time on sustainable urbanization. We were extremely happy to see that the discourse exactly was about harnessing the potential of urbanization for sustainable development. That's a major shift in the discourse. And I think what we're doing today is also then making that link with, uh, with stability. But I would say the focus should be on, on harnessing the potential rather than just mitigating, uh, mitigating problems. As you inhabit it, we're trying to lead on this new urban agenda. We're working towards our big Habitat 3 conference in 2016, uh, which is all about harnessing that potential, making sure that, ur that urbanization is planned. And in doing so, we do guarantee inclusivity or do work towards inclusivity and equity, which are two key notions exactly, or two key conditions necessary to arrive at uh, stability and overcome uh, fragility. Now, is the UN fit for purpose? Um, my answer would be no. Um, one, because we tend to focus top down. We tend to focus exactly on national governments. I mean, they have much stronger focus on, on, on local authorities and how to engage with them. And from there, how to engage also with informal sectors of uh, society. And uh, very importantly, also, of course, the private, uh, the private sector. And people's own investment uh, capacity. Um, for the moment, we, we are doing this, talking about land and conflict. We're really trying to re rethink how the UN system, from the peace make making to the peace building to the development of the humanitarians, can come together much, uh, much stronger. And we're also doing it amongst the humanitarians and the development when it comes to engaging in, uh, in urban areas. And I'll end there. Thank you. Mm, uh, Philippe, thank you for that very instructive experience for our conversation that will ensue. Uh, Jennifer? Thanks very much, Warren. Um, and thanks also to Andrea and Philippe uh, for giving me what um, couldn't have been a better <laughs> introduction into my remarks, um, and in particular to Andrea for having taken the time to go a bit more into detail on the research in the urban dilemma um, baseline study that we commissioned, which I hadn't actually planned to do because I was asked to focus more on preliminary findings. Um, so I really feel like you actually know quite a bit about safe and inclusive cities already, given um, the introductions that or the, the comments that Andrea and Philippe made, because so many of the issues and and um, topics for for debate and, and discussion and research um, have that are being addressed in safe and inclusive cities have come up in, in their comments. And so, I mean, I've just been scribbling them down here. Issues about land and housing, formality and informality, social cohesion, crime, violence, and how they link up with social networks, poverty and inequalities, displacement, access to services like water, electricity, sanitation, and transport. I think the only thing that's being, that sort of top of mind is that's being covered by safe and inclusive cities that didn't come up in those presentations are gender dynamics. Um, so let me take a step back and, and tell you a bit more about the program and then um, share some very preliminary findings um, with you. So for those of you who don't know IDRC, um, we're an agency of the Canadian government, uh, and our mission is to support research uh, on international development topics, mainly in developing countries by developing country researchers. Um, so if this will advance. There we go. So Safe and Inclusive Cities um, is a five-year research 
initiative that's co-funded actually by IDRC and the United Kingdom's Department for International Development. Uh, our goal is to understand the causes of urban violence and how they link up with uh, poverty and inequalities. As Warren mentioned, we're also trying to figure out what works and what doesn't in terms of interventions to, produce, to prevent and reduce, not to produce, to prevent and reduce um, urban violence. And so to that end, we're putting uh, $11 million over five years into funding 15 research projects in Latin America, South Asia, and Sub-Saharan Africa. And together, they're um, investigating these themes in 40 cities in 20 countries. I'd be really happy to go into what each of the projects is doing, but 15 projects takes a lot of time to go through. And, um, and so maybe some of that can come out in, in discussion. Um, I do want to highlight that we feel we're dealing, we're working with the best of the best in this regard. We, ha we held a pretty rigorous competitive process in 2012. Um, we got more than 300 proposals from some of the st top organizations in the North and the South working on these issues. And all of the projects that we um, that, that were successful are most of them are multi-city. All of them are um, multi-partner initiatives, and all of them are um, being led by researchers in the global south and taking interdisciplinary approaches um, to to understanding these issues. So we really feel that we're getting a very rich um, way to address these issues. Um, I must apologize, I'm very tired and extremely jet lagged because I've just come back from two weeks visiting partners um, and, and learning much more about their projects in Zimbabwe and, and South Africa. So I'm, I've been up since four and it's starting to <laughs> catch up with me. Um, I do want to highlight uh, that, the, that Robert Mugga's um, baseline study that we commissioned researching the urban dilemma is available on the IDRC website and uh, you'd be welcome to, to download it for free, um, idrc.ca slash cities and uh, and yeah we really use that as um, a, as a process through which to gather and get a sense of the state of knowledge theory and practice um, at that place where urban violence poverty and, and inequalities meet um, so the baseline for from our perspective confirmed our suspicion that in an urbanizing world many important players in international developments particularly bilateral donors multilateral or multilateral organizations local and international development organizations are behind the curve in terms of how to operate in urban contexts and i think that that philippe's comments um, really sort of reflected that that grappling with how to engage and and how to um, adapt institutions to uh, to be able to do that in an effective way. Um, additionally, and I think this comes as no surprise, the burden of violence is, is largely borne by those least able to cope with it, um, particularly the urban poor and other marginalized groups. Um, so our assumption, our, our starting assumption, is that safety can't happen without the inclusion of those most um, affected, in the, without the inclusion in the decision-making decision process of those most effective. Um, I've already said all that. So let me um, give you some some crunchy bits. Um, so I've got we've we've got preliminary findings for from two or three projects starting to come out. Um, I should mention that most of the projects the the program itself is five years. The research projects are between two and three years. So we're just one year through substantive research. Most of the projects have um, sort of are, are wrapping up their data collection and starting on analysis. And so we're just starting to get some some crunchy bits, as I say. So we have a project in um, that's one of our cross-regional projects. We have three cross-regional projects that are that are looking at countries in two different regions or three different regions. And one of them is trying to understand um, how major violence reduction interventions, and in this case, they're looking at the violence prevention through urban upgrading program in Cape Town, South Africa, and the police pacifying units, the UPP in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, um, how those sort of flagship violence reduction interventions are changing the dynamics of social cohesion in, in communities and how that impacts on rates of crime and violence. And so our, our partners in Brazil um, have analyzed crime and demographic data over, the, over I think, a 20-year period. They started with 1991 data and subsequently um, up to, I think, the most recent they had is 2010 data. And they found that, among other things, um, certainly the things that, that were confirmed were that 
major urban centers have, the larger the, the metropolis, the um, higher the per capita rates of violence, which I think is, is useful. Um, but one of the, the most interesting findings that they found was rather than per capita income being important in terms of violence, violence rates are actually close, really closely correlated with the average income of the poorest quintile, so the poorest 20% of the population. And this relationship gets stronger the farther back you look. So poverty in 1991 is having a really strong influence on violence in 2010. And what this tells us, or what this tells our, our partners, is that income transfer programs may be really important. In Brazil, they have two programs um, called the Bolsa Familia and the Bolsa Escola, and perhaps Warren can tell us more about those, <laughs> um, which is essentially a, a minimum wage for um, poor families who are vaccinating their children through the Bolsa Familia and sending their kids to school through the Bolsa Escola. Uh, and so increasing programs or expanding programs like that may be a way to, over time, and keeping in mind that, that these are, you know, it does take time for these, these interventions to have an impact, these may be ways to have, um, to, to reduce urban violence. And, and it's not, I should stress, it's a correlation, it's not causation, um, but clearly there are, there are many intervening variables that go along with increased income that allow um, for a, a reduction in violence or being able to choose alternative means to resolve conflict. Um, another finding that came out of that analysis was that net high school enrollment um, has similar correlations to, um, to the average income of the poorest quintile. Um, and this suggests that improving the quality of education or the number of years of compulsory schooling could have a positive impact over the medium to long term. So in Brazil, um, primary education is near universal, but students start to fall out of school in secondary schools. And this is partly because the quality of that, of that education isn't particularly high, as I'm told, um, but also that the compulsory, education is only compulsory, I believe, to age 15. And so perhaps adding an extra year of compulsory education could keep kids in school and um, have that mediating effect on violence. So the partner, um, <clears throat> the other half of this study in South Africa uh, is analyze, has analyzed national fear of crime data um, over I think the last 10 years, don't quote me on that. Um, and one of the interesting things coming out of that analysis is that they're finding that confidence in the police and satisfaction with um, local crime reduction efforts have an inverse relationship with fear. And I don't think this is terribly surprising, but I think it's really important to be documenting it. And I think that the correlation, that correlation highlights the importance of the legitimacy of institutions, such as the police, which as many of you know, I'm sure, is a major challenge in South Africa where the police have a fractured relationship with many key communities. And when the inverse is true, when trust in institutions and satisfaction with local crime inter reduction efforts are low, communities will often resort to vigilantism to maintain social order and therefore sort of reinforce and undermine the role of law and, and law enforcement agencies. So taken together, these suggest that policy prescriptions of investing in institutions, um, building and changing the way uh, key institutions interact with communities, such as policing, policing may be very important. And carrying on with the, the, the idea of institutions, our project, um, the project that we're supporting in Venezuela is, a, is a, exactly addressing that question. Um, they're challenging the, sorry, let me back up. So Venezuela has, um, unlike many countries, very low levels of income inequality, but very high levels of urban violence. One of the things that we tend to see um, internationally is a correlation between high levels of income inequality and high levels of urban violence. In Venezuela, that's not the case. So this is a question um, for, our, for our research partners. And so they're trying to understand um, why that is. And their hypothesis is that uh, institutions, social and state institutions, play an important mediating role um, in, in terms of, of violence, um, both private and public violence. And so the case studies that this team has done, I think in something like 13 communities um, in two or three cities in, in Venezuela, particularly regarding the police, but extending to formal um, social pacts and written and customary laws that govern life in cities, shows that um, absent functional state institutions, the value of social capital and how women in particular have used social capital to contain violence through ceasefires, through negotiating ceasefires, through developing social pacts and peace commissions, both among themselves and, and with men, um, to build for informal and stabilizing institutions is extremely important. Um, 
maybe because if I have time, just two minutes, uh, and to pick up on the on the gender topic, um, there's a the, our our program in um, in Pakistan, which is trying to understand the the role of urban violence. Um, one of the again really early findings that that we're finding interesting uh, from that project is that they've done surveys in Karachi, Islamabad, and Rawalpindi. Um, household level surveys and what they're finding is that people are, aren't so much afraid or the, the violence that affects them most is not this very public, very catastrophic, um, very sort of sensationalized is the wrong word, but something, something like sensationalized um, violence that we see and uh, tragically such as, as the um, bombing of the, uh, at the Karachi airport recently, is, that's actually not what, what makes people at the household level and communities afraid. They're much more concerned on a daily basis of, they feel much more threatened by um, much more banal and everyday violence. The, the, the youth on the street corner who's sort of hanging out there looking menacing, um, police often or strangers who come through the community, um, agents of the state are, are, are the people who they, who they find threatening. And so I think that this sort, sort of helps to challenge um, the dominant discourse that the problem in Pakistan with violence and violence in cities is the Taliban, whereas what the community members are telling us is that they don't feel afraid of that so much themselves, where they find, find um, fear in, in their everyday lives is, is really in, more in their communities and integrated into their communities and, and how they and their and other community members interact with people moving through the communities. So like I say, these are some really early findings from Safe and Inclusive Cities projects. Uh, the, most of the projects are continuing for at least another year, many of them for another two years. And so um, I really encourage you to watch this space, and I'd be very happy to talk a bit more about um, any of the projects that you'd be interested in hearing about. Uh, thank you, Jennifer. We have um, about 17, 18 minutes for question and answer comment. Uh, once again, uh, the way to get my attention is to put your stand like that and I will call on you in the order I see them. And uh, once again, when I call on you, please introduce yourself by name and association. This is for the sake of the webcast, which is right behind you. Uh, the first uh, I saw was John Hirsch, and then Imtiaz. Uh, <clears throat> I'm, I'm with IPI. First of all, thank you all very, very much. Uh, three weeks ago or two weeks ago, the president of Iceland was in this room, and he spoke about uh, food security and geothermal energy, and how 20% of world's food is wasted these days, was his assertion, simply rots and thrown away. Uh, and so he was suggesting looking at energy as a way to save more food. Um, I have two very brief questions. One is, it seemed to me there's a contrast, which you didn't quite draw, between cities in countries emerging from conflict such as Somalia, and cities that are just getting bigger, such as Tokyo. I mean, it sounds to me like they're totally different sort of facets. So I wonder if you could clarify where you're looking. And then, particularly given your remarks on Tokyo, uh, Andrea, and the very last remarks on Cape Town, uh, and maybe Brasilia or Brazil, Rio, do you have some examples where there's been success in dealing with these problems, and it'll be interesting. And what were the factors in those cities that brought about, you know, reasonable success in dealing with these threats? Thanks. Uh, panel, just keep those questions in mind. And Imtiaz, if you would introduce yourself, please, for the sake of the camera. Uh, Imtiaz Ahmed, I'm from the University of Dhaka, Bangladesh. Uh, I was just wondering, in fact, something that Iftikhar started by saying. Uh, referring to China, that China r resolved. And you do see that if you go to Chengdu or Kunming and some of the cities, uh, even Lhasa, you know, uh, extraordinary how they have, you know, resolved some of the basic problems. And immediately that comes to your mind, if you visit all these Chinese cities, is resources. And then if you travel to India, you see uh, the problem of not having resources. So I was just wondering, in fact, uh, to what extent uh, the problem lies uh, with the city itself. Because somehow you, you, uh, the impression one gets that it's, it's a problem of the city per se, but it may not be the case. It may be an overall issue, in fact. And one should go case by case 
with all the cities, in fact, to see uh, whether the specificities are more important than the generalizations. Because uh, let me give one example. Even if you look at the crime index, and I was looking at the crime index, in fact, you will not see the relationship between the poverty and the crime index. In fact, some of the cities, except for Karachi, and, and that's, a, I can argue, for totally different re reasons, uh, the, the Shia-Sunni uh, conflict probably has kept uh, Karachi very high. But you are not going to see uh, you know, many of the poverty-ridden cities uh, as uh, you know, very high in crime index. Detroit is number 10, in fact. And it's amazing uh, that uh, you get uh, Kuala Lumpur uh, to be 15th, uh, which is otherwise uh, you know, uh, quite, uh, quite a city, which is a workable city. So I was thinking that to relate the violence and poverty um, I think that's too much of an overgeneralization, and one has to be very careful in doing that. Uh, in the back, maybe somebody can lend you a microphone. Uh, hi, good morning. Shamina De Gonzaga, World Council of Peoples for the UN. Um, I think the first question talked about if there are any success stories. I'm particularly interested when you're discussing the involvement of those most affected you mentioned the police specification program in Rio, and I don't know what your studies found, but I've heard from a variety of sources that there's been quite a backlash and a lot of suspicion towards this project. Um, are there, I also saw a, few, a couple years ago in Rio that there were some kind of favela-led projects to advocate for more direct involvement in the urban planning process as the city changes. I'm wondering if you could comment more specifically. Thank you. Maybe I'll go to the panel now to, uh, oh, there's another question. Sorry, please. Yes, uh, good morning. My name is Gerardo Nado from UNDP, or from the Bureau of Latin America and the Caribbean. I think very interesting presentation. I'd just like to uh, point to one issue, and I'd like to, the, the panelists to, to um, build on that. Um, of course, uh, the question of inequality and poverty is huge in, in most of our countries, and particularly in Latin America, that most of them are already middle income countries. But the inequalities are, are huge issues associated with lack of security, and definitely that phenomenon is, is concentrated on, on cities. Um, but in terms of when you look at the inequalities, as we would like to call, of course there is income inequality and poverty, but, of, but we had gender issues, which are major in the region. Ethnic issues, uh, not just uh, looking at uh, indigenous peoples, uh, concentrated in some countries, but generally present in most of them. And of course, Afro descendants, uh, which are huge um, in terms of, of numbers, not just in Brazil, but in a lot of Central American countries in the Caribbean. So I think uh, if any of the uh, research is looking at that kind of uh, dimension in terms of inequalities, and for example, you mentioned the case in, in Venezuela when you had very high level of insecurity and, and, and less uh, inequality uh, in, in comparatively to other countries. And of course, if when you, you see, uh, there is a graphic inequality and exclusion in terms of, of, of a land space. If you look, go to Caracas, and of course you, you know the barrio, like the favela or the villa in Buenos Aires, or the favela in the Brazilian case, along with the, with the urbanizations, with the more, uh, of course, um, regularized, systematized uh, rule of law places in the city, and that are just across the street. Um, so I think there are different dimensions of exclusion that is not just only related to income inequality, but the other inequalities, and, and, and so I think you have to look at those issues too. So now we'll go to the, I think I'll do the panel in reverse order to what we did before, and particularly Jennifer, since both Venezuela and Brazil were specifically commented upon. Why don't you pick it up there, and then we'll go to Philippe and uh, Andrea. Sure. Thanks, thanks everybody, for those um, really interesting questions, and I'll try to do my best to answer them. Um, given that I'm not actually doing this research, I wish I was, and, and I have, um, you know, considerable opportunities to engage with our with our partners, but uh, I, I unfortunately don't get to go and do their field research with them. Um, so let me just sort of move through these kind of randomly, or perhaps in some sort of structured way. Um, I would say that yes, I. 
when I first joined the program, I think we were talking about inequality and my and, and as we've worked on and, and talked through it more, we really are talking about inequalities. So we have at least three projects that are specifically addressing um, gender issues. There's one that's looking at Rio and Maputo, one that's looking at um, from a legal perspective, more women's rights in um, in Harare and two other two other cities in in Zimbabwe, and then the project in Pakistan that I mentioned earlier. Um, and I, I do want to highlight that one of those projects is specifically looking at masculinities. I know some often we and this is my gender expertise coming out, so I'll I'll try and be brief. Often we we conflate gender with women, and I think that that's um, understandable for for a variety of reasons. But it's it is really inter interesting and important, I think, to look at at the other side of femininity at, at masculinities. Um, so I completely agree. Yes, it's not just about income inequality. I think one of the reasons why we tend to focus on income inequality is we have much better measures of it, and so and and. And comparable measures across countries. So it's much easier to compare with the Gini coefficient, et cetera, et cetera, um, across countries. But, but yes, I, I agree. And thank you for highlighting those, those differences um, in, in Latin America, which, as you say, are much more middle income countries with different kinds of inequalities really revealing themselves. And, and certainly, um, we have three projects that are focused on Latin America and three and all three cross regional projects um, are looking at Rio de Janeiro. So we're we're we've got six projects looking at of the 15 looking at at Latin America specifically. And um, and certainly those issues are coming up um, that they were planned into the projects and, and are definitely coming up. Um, and I'm sorry, I don't have more uh, sort of crunchy bits to share with you right now. In terms of, um, of sort of success and and factors um, bringing about success. I mean, I, I and, and picking up on Cape Town and, and Rio, um, I sort of have two or three things to say about that. The first is that um, that's one of the things that we're really trying to do through this research project is, is evaluate some of these projects to figure out what works and what doesn't. And so I don't have a hard and fast answer yet because the projects are, are in the middle. Um, what I would say is that I don't think that any of the, the projects, and we have about five or six that are evaluating specific interventions, none of them is, is going in sort of with an ax to grind or or um, expecting to be, be demonstrating that these are complete wastes of money. Um, certainly, one of the reasons why we're interested in them is because they are large investments. They, they are, um, in some cases, very resource intense. And, uh, and, and we're curious to know, are they having the impact that they think they are? And are they um, having sort of what economists would call positive externalities or negative externalities, sort of those unintended consequences um, and, and what do they look like. Um, specifically on, on Rio um, and the UPP, I, I think it's unfortunate that Rob Maga wasn't able to be here today because he's actually done quite a bit of this research uh, in evaluating the impact of, of UPP. And the, the data that he's collected shows that, that in UPP areas, violence has reduced. Um, punto. And I mean, you can have a conversation and you can ask questions about, is that is that simply displacement into other areas? If I recall correctly, and, and Rob really would be the person to ask on this, um, but if I recall correctly from the data that he's shared with me, uh, that yeah, it, it has had a knock-on effect, at least within a certain um, sort of radius out from the, from the the central favela where, where the UPP um, has been implemented. Um, I mean, I think you can have a, a really heated conversation about decisions regarding where to implement UPP and is it being implemented where it's most needed or is it being implemented strategically and what are the political decisions behind um, those, those what are the politics behind those decisions? Um, and, and yeah, I, I think that that's one of the reasons why we really like working with um, with developing country partners, people working and living in these contexts themselves, because they're much better placed to have those those conversations. And I think that their um, constructive criticism carries a lot more weight and is a lot more legitimate than you know a bureaucrat from Canada coming and saying you should be um, putting this here and not there. So so I think that's um, all I'll say about that. I, I would just say also that. Um, just to let you know a bit about the three projects that are looking at the three safe and inclusive cities projects that are looking at Rio. Um, one of them is this question about social cohesion. One of them is um, looking at, mas at nonviolent masculinities and how um, men choose to kind of move in and out of 
in particular drug related violence and and sort of the 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 drug um, dealing gangs in the favelas and the third is um, a fascinating project that's looking at the impact of urban mega projects on um, the communities that are nearby them and so in Rio, I think this is extremely timely because the one, one of the thing, the interventions that they're sorry the development projects that they're looking at are stadiums being built for the World Cup. Um, that's a, that partner sorry that project is one of our cross regional projects, and it's also looking at similar dynamics in Durban around port development. Durban has the second largest port in Africa, that, and it's I was just there last week, and it's being developed. Um, and then in Mumbai around similar um, infrastructure, I think. If, road diversionary um, projects. Um, yeah, I think that's probably where I'll leave it and let other people go I'm going to, we're not going to have time for a second round of questions, so I want to make sure Mr. Ahobim is represented. Would you ask your question now and then Philippe and, uh, and Andre? Thank you, Orin Ahobim from Dahlberg. Um, Philippe, you mentioned the, the social contract concept, which I think is very powerful. I'm curious in the panelists' thoughts about the social contract in terms of the government's responsibilities to the people of the city. Uh, and in most cities of the world, in fact, there is a well-functioning or, or a functioning uh, a city-level government. And so curious about in terms of provision of services, provision of infrastructure, especially for those that are the most vulnerable and the poorest uh, in, in the city, what's the social contract there? What's the responsibility of the governments? And how do we get that accountability to work better? Excellent. Philippe? Um, I, well, to start with, with the last part, um, I mean, the, the points, of course, you have to work with the resources you have. And so, uh, and this for me, working exactly in these very poor countries like Somalia and others, it is about maximizing um, the resources, the family's own resources, uh, private sector uh, and others. So the key role exactly there for local authorities to really maximize and, and the resources at, at hand, but making sure exactly that's an inclusive process, that people themselves are setting priorities. Um, we had our um, World Urban Forum in Medellin uh, couple of months ago, and the topic, the topic was equity, and I know Medellin has been one of the case studies. And there, in terms of the, I think it's also exactly the, this, just the notion of, of access to opportunities. Whatever is out there, there is some level of equal access to opportunities, and Medellin made great progress exactly in, in giving uh, people that were physically close on the slums in Medellin, but access to, uh, to downtown, just to, by installing a cable cart not just the physical infrastructure, but also just the whole social process of getting them involved in, uh, in the action. So, and I want to just to jump to the, to the remark on China. I mean, yes, I think China has been extremely good at um, putting in the resources to physically plan the urbanization. But we know these investments are very long term. So I, I think we are um, wondering if in the long term, there will uh, other problems will emerge, especially from social uh, inclusive uh, nature. And uh, the World Bank just came out with a report working with, uh, I forgot, the IDC in, in China, uh, and putting forward one of the key recommendations was exactly the whole issue of, of uh, citizenship. We know in the Chinese cities, a lot of people don't have citizenship, uh, are, are in a temporary status. But in the end, that kind of inclusiveness on the political, not just the physical, access to uh, transport and access to services, but also the social and the political will be critical to, uh, I would say, to ensure inclusiveness, overcome issues of equity, and maybe uh, ensure uh, that some of the tensions that might be there don't turn into uh, fragile, uh, fragile uh, situations. So our focus is indeed on the longer term planned urbanization, but it goes very much hand in hand with access, equal access to opportunities and resources. And one that we're struggling with is exactly because is land. How to ensure uh, equal access to land, and so we don't end up with uh, and public space. We don't end up with with segregation, which for us is one of the first uh, conditions resulting then exactly in in exacerbating uh, conflict and tension. Thank you. So I'm going to be very brief because I know there's 
so many here with more expertise than I have, and I want to make sure we get to our next session on time so we can hear from all of you in that discussion. And of course, first on the success stories, the case studies that we'll hear today have been asked to identify some success stories. And I think an interesting part of that is the idea of local resilience versus more broad across the city. So one, one of our authors pointed out, here's an example of individual resilience. And we can all tell, I think, inspiring stories of a specific neighborhood or even a specific microenterprise that has thrived in a challenging circumstance, but how to take those lessons and transform them into collective resilience or broader programming is really a challenge that we're trying to explore in this project. And just to um, address kind of which cities are you looking at, in our project, we're trying to look at both this kind of explosion, mega city issues. So the next session, we'll look at Lagos and Mumbai, where certainly you have those aspects, but also to look at um, fragile cities in countries affected by conflict and by broader kind of um, interventions. So we have Port-au-Prince for that reason as well. Um, but just to say, I think part of the context here is that these connections are not precisely understood yet. So we have fragile cities in countries affected by conflict. We have them in countries that are largely peaceful. And as we've said, there are no kind of black and white correlations between governance, violence, um, and economic level as well. And even city size, you sometimes have small cities that are more violent than the large cities. And I think some of our authors have said that it will be these small to medium sized cities that see the most stress over the next decades as well. So I just encourage you to um, listen to the case studies. And in these next sessions, I know there's many people here like Jennifer who have um, projects and ongoing research to help us add to this body of quantitative data. So we really want to hear from you in the next sessions. Thank you. What Jennifer calls the crunchy parts. Uh, I like that reference. Uh, we're going to take a break for 15 minutes. Uh, or if you'd be back, please, at a quarter of. Um, and we will then be taking up the subject of planning and running cities, the governance element. I would like to thank our panel for a great start to this day's seminar.